Today, I am thrilled on behalf of all of us to welcome as our guest, Professor Shai Davidai of my alma mater, Columbia University. What a distinction we share, Shai. Shai, you need no introduction, but introduce I will nonetheless. Shai Davidai, for those of you who don't know, is an Israeli professor at Columbia Business School where he teaches managerial negotiation, which quite honestly seems incredibly relevant and helpful for what, for what we're going through. He received his undergraduate degree from the Hebrew University in Jerusalem in psychology and cognitive science and moved to the United States in 2010 to pursue a PhD in social psychology from Cornell. He also did his postdoctoral research at Princeton University and has taught as well as an assistant professor at the New School for Social Research. I'm very happy to say he is a dog lover, and we'll discuss that another time. However, ever since October 7th, Shai has been devoting his time and energy to battle against support for terrorism and the rise in anti-Semitism at Columbia University and colleges, and indeed outside of colleges all over the country. He resides in New York City with his wife and their son. And here's a key statistic that we can all help with. Shai is today, I believe, just a hair under 100,000 followers. Mm. And he is indefatigable, relentless, articulate, and damn smart. So take note uh, of his X and Instagram handles. Very easy to remember usernames of at Shai Davidai or Shai Davidai. You'll find him easily. He's just like Shohei Otani, not a Madonna. Everyone uses his first and last name, but everyone knows him. So welcome, Shai. Thank um, you. Thank you for having me. I do want to say two things. One is important. Yeah. I also have a daughter, uh, an oh. almost three-year-old daughter. Um, and the other thing, but while you were introducing everything, uh, you mentioned 135,000 Jews is making Eva it. Eva Weinberger. Uh, Join the meeting. 150,000 citizens in the Westchester area, Jewish citizens. I think that might, somebody, smarter people can check me, but that might make Westchester one of the largest Jewish suburban populations in the world, not just in the United States. Right, uh, Israel. Israel is mostly urban, and most of our population is in cities. I don't know. If we have a large suburban area, um, so you know, people should check me on that. But that—that that is a good distinction. We're going to fact check that. How's that? Um, so uh, we typically, as everyone knows, a lot an hour. This is a, a big, dense topic, and we have lots of directions to go in. So we may spill over, folks. You're welcome to stay. It's all recorded. If not, we understand, but I suspect we may we may go over. With that said, as I said, we're now in day 222 of this horrific tragedy. I learned to write these numbers backwards so people can actually read them. So let me just start out and ask, where were you, Shai, on October 7th, and how did you first hear of these barbaric attacks? Yeah, um, I was here in New York City. Uh, we just finished uh, Shabbat dinner. My parents were visiting from Israel. Um, so we had a nice Shabbat dinner with my parents, my kids. Um, they, they, my parents went uh, home. We had, um, you know, did the dishes, you know, organized everything uh, before we go to sleep. And right before we go to sleep, um, you know, we do the thing that we automatically do almost mindlessly. We take out our phones and kind of like just scroll a little bit. And we got a WhatsApp message from my wife's uh, sister. And it's like this it's ironic, to, it's funny to say, but it's a beautiful picture of her son, who is about a year and, and change, standing up with just a diaper, looking at the TV screen, and it says, Barrage of Rockets onto Tel Aviv. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're used to that. We, it's, it doesn't, it, we're not, we're unfazed by like rockets on Tel Aviv, but we said, let's go check. And, you know, we opened uh, the internet, we ch our computers, we checked some information and we immediately realized, okay, this is not something that we're used to. This is something different. Um, the moment I saw a white Toyota pickup truck driving around Sderot, uh, which is a city where, you know, just a regular city, but we all visit. Uh, I had hummus there with my brother in July. Um, you know, shooting, just randomly shooting uh, the buildings, I realized this is something else. So we stayed up all night, mm. just not even taking it in. It was because we we didn't even know what we were taking in. It was more about just like bearing witness to what's happening. Here, here. 
And and let me just ask, how is your family? I hope everyone in Israel is safe or as safe as they should be. Yeah, um, everyone is safe. Everyone is physically safe. Um, it, Israelis are tough as hell. You know, we we we. You know, we we live through this. We um, when I, I was back home a few weeks ago, we can talk about that. Um, and I I had a beer with a friend, my oldest friend, who's we've been friends since we were five, so almost thirty six years. And he is a doctor in reserve duty, so he's been in reserves almost ever since October seventh. He was there on October 9th in Kibbutz Beri, um, you know, help, helping doing whatever. Uh, he's been twice in Gaza um, as a doctor, going in, uh, saving soldiers' lives. And he's worried about me. Hmm. And I said, what are you even talking about? Don't, like, you, 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 you're not even aware of how resilient you are. And I say, my friend, but also just as a people. So, yeah, people, some people are safer than others, but everyone is just so resilient, which is incredible. Fantastic. So um, let's let's reach back for a second, if if at all possible, to pre October seventh, and and uh, can you can you reach back and tell us what were your thoughts then about being uh, Israeli and Jewish on campus again pre October seventh? What what was your organic existence like before? Yeah, great question. And I'll be, you know, if I'm completely honest, I did not give it any thought. It was not something that needed to be, you needed, you didn't need to spend any thought on it, right? The fact that I'm Jewish was up until October 7th, a personal thing. You know, I'm, I'm deeply Jewish. I'm, I'm not religiously Jewish, but I'm deeply Jewish. I joined the meeting. I'm ethnically, culturally Jewish. I I feel like I'm I'm deeply part of the tribe, and it doesn't matter if you're an Orthodox or it doesn't. We're all part of it, but I didn't think about it because I didn't need to think about it. The fact that I'm Israeli is, you know, my name is Shai, my accent is Israeli. I've never hid, hidden the fact that I'm Israeli, but it's never been front and center because it never needed it. it we didn't need to put it front and center. Um, you know, it would come up at times when things would flare up in Israel. People would ask how my family is doing. Um, they would ask a little bit about my opinions, my views, but nothing serious. Um, it came up a bit when uh, when Kanye West, Dave Chappelle went on anti-Semitic rants. And I was quite frustrated that none of my colleagues said or did anything um, where they they have said and did stuff when it, uh, other groups have been targeted. Yet it wasn't something that was an, a salient part of my life. Like I, I used to describe myself as a partner, husband, and researcher. And now I, I describe That's myself yeah. as a Jewish Israeli Zionist husband, partner, and researcher, right? Like my, my, my identity hasn't changed, but things have come to the surface more. Here, 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 here. All right, so let's try to organize our, our conversation a little bit because, as I said, we can go on for hours. And frankly, I see sort of too many streams to 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 try to organize here. But let me let me hit on a few, and then we'll kind of try and tackle them one by one, if possible. First of all, there's the pre-trauma, Israel and the Middle East, um, and and I would include there more so maybe what was bubbling here beneath the surface, or or maybe frankly for us in plain sight. Uh, for years in those years, where, as you said, you yourself didn't uh, uh, label yourself as a as a, a, a Jewish and Israeli professor. Uh, then there's, of course, the immediate trauma and immediate sympathy, and the almost as immediate blind eye toward uh, barbaric acts and rape and murder. And then a groundswell of hate from from core jihadists to voyeurs. Like that's the spectrum. Those are the goalposts. And and then the virus propagating and being aided with, with intent and disregard. And then I think I want to get into what you've been doing. You know, our best and most effective pushback, our allies, what is our ideology? And then tomorrow, what, what can we do tomorrow? And I'll, and, I'll, and I'll kick that off, never being negative and always being the forever optimist. You know, in the venture capital world, we, we, we always have to be optimists. But, you know, I always fall back on 
the Herzlian Im Tirzu. We just have to figure out where we want to end up and find the course. So I remember watching your your video, and, and I'm, I'm assuming almost everybody here uh, uh, watched the video you posted that fateful week. Um, I'm not sure what day it was. Maybe it was the 12th, but it was pretty immediately after. And first of all, I was shaken. I was instantly, I worked, if you remember, to locate you, and I reached out on LinkedIn. And I, I, the reason was I, I knew that all of us saw your reaction at that moment, and you were expressing all of our deepest anxieties and fears. So Tell us what happened on campus and what didn't happen that kind of led you to record that video. Yeah, so, so I do wanna say something about trauma because you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, all of this is inherently about trauma. And when we talk about trauma, we have to also remember trauma is not one-sided, right? Like the story of Jews in Israel has been traumatic, not since 1948, since 1880s, you know, with Chobe And the stories of the Arabs of the land has been traumatic. We cannot push that apart, push that aside. The story of Jews in the United States has been, it's growing and it was simmering underground, but there is trauma here. There's just 9-11 was extremely traumatic, but also the reaction to the end of Islamophobia has been traumatic for a lot of people the problem is not the trauma mm -hmm. it's the, it's the sides that deny the other side's trauma mm -hmm. and i've always said if i can accept the trauma of innocent civilians in gaza that have been taken hostage by hamas in this senseless war i don't understand why American, you know, students from the Midwest that have no horse in this race cannot accept my trauma, right? Trauma is not zero sum. We can accept both sides. And when I spoke up, I spoke out of trauma. It really was me observing a campus that is letting hate, just pure hate, uh, rear its ugly head. And observing an administration that was unwilling to do anything. And people say, wow, you spoke up, you were so brave, you whatever. And it was like, no, it wasn't, I wasn't brave at all. I have just reached my limit. I really do believe that each and every one of us have a, a, a red line, like a line in the sand where we say, if you push me to that point, I will have to fight for myself, not violently and peacefully, but I will have to fight for myself. I just reached that line very early on because I still cannot understand why the administration, seeing October 7th, seeing what we have seen, could not have come out on October 8th and said, what Hamas did was wrong, period. Sincerely, Minu Shafiq. Then, you know, other emails. But the fact that they didn't do that signaled to the world, hate is acceptable. And that's what I was reacting to. So so let's just touch on that for a second. Did you, because um, everything happened so fast in those days and it's a bit of a blur, but had you reached out to anybody in Columbia administration in those few days before you posted the video saying, you know, where, where are you guys? Yes, yes, the, definitely. Def great question. So, you know, I'm not, I'm not the kind of person to just like scream, scream, scream and not, you know, and then why are you not doing anything? So on October 11th, uh, when we, when I first found out about the uh, the pro Hamas protest that was planned for the next day, um, I told my immediate employer, the dean of the business school, um, "This can't go on. Like, you need to alert the higher ups um, because I don't have direct channel, but but he does, and he's very great, very supportive." The next day, 8 a.m. on October 12th, went to uh, was in a meeting with the president had her read the, the, the letter by the pro-Hamas organizations where they call October 7th a historic day, explain the concerns of the Israeli and Jewish people, explain the lack, the, the moral depravity of this. Right. So really bringing it to the surface and the reaction from the administration was, don't worry, we'll just bring in the cops. <laughs> well, if you know you need to bring in the cops, you know there is a danger. Why even appease it in the first place? This was on October 12th, right? right? And then I and then 
after that, I, I, I started calling on the administration to just, just condemn Hamas. That's it. That was my first. People forget. Like, my first few weeks were all focused on have a, a formal condemnation of Hamas, just like you condemned Putin's invasion of Russia, of, of Ukraine, just like you uh, condemned the Boko Haram's uh, horrible uh, kidnapping of 200 Nigerian girls, just like you condemned other moral depravities, just do that. Because I really did believe and still believe that if that was done, we would have had a very different trajectory. Mm. Well, we'll get, we'll get into that, and I, and I hear you. I got to say, and everybody feels this way, I mean, you were so visceral and organic and at the same time so articulate. I mean, even, dare I say, composed and on point in your video that I, I've i watched it several times and I'm thinking, did he write this out? But, you know, it was visceral. I, you were, you I did were, not. That's the thing. It, it exactly. was just coming out. I, I, I describe it every time I talk as, you know, I never write out what I want to say. Sometimes I write, like, here's like bullet point. It's, I, I talk from the heart through the brain. That's what I say. It's like, it comes from the gut and I just have some screening. People say you're so outspoken. Well, if you knew what I really want to say and how, like I cut out 90% of the things I want to say, I'm not outspoken. I'm afraid to say the things. It's only the things that pass through the brain and give get the permission of like, okay, you can, you're allowed to say this. You're you, Sometimes I just want to scream at the world and at everyone in it. I know you've got that. You've got your editor here and your editor here on each shoulder. So so uh, you and I have talked about this and and uh, you touch on it now. If, if President Shafiq uh, would even step up and, and call out Hamas for who they are and apologize today, is it too late? I mean, we say it's never too late, but in the sense that, you know, Colombia has in, in many ways gotten to the point of no return. And I want to get into this more that it's gone viral to me it feels too late for that you know what i'll call gesture it, it's yeah beyond... so you know let's separate that question into two parts is sure. it too late morally no it's not too late in fact on april 5th uh was the first time that the president president shafiq used hamas the word hamas in an in an official communication april 5th right. so six months minus two days after the massacre obviously she did it because she was going to testify in front of congress and she but that before that it's as if hamas does not exist in her mind or was not you know responsible so morally ethically it was not too late pragmatically it was you know it was obviously too late there's no like it, it, it the damage has already been done you know 10 times uh well, tenfold right but it was at least for us, the Jewish community, the Israeli community, like at least knowing, okay, at least now you want, we know that you understand, even if you're forced to understand because you're under investigation, but now you understand what is really happening. Understood. Um, so I want to touch on one other thing, which um, is, is related. I want to come back to, to uh, faculty and administration, but uh, I also want to touch on a post that I believe was made by Students for Justice in Palestine, by SJP, uh, I believe on October 6th, if I'm not mistaken, October 6th. Now, I, I may be wrong, I'm no conspiracy here, but apparently the SJP Instagram or Twitter account, I don't think it was the Columbia one, was dormant. Yeah, the Instagram account. Yeah. The Instagram account was dormant for quite a long time, like a long, long time like not weeks or months, but maybe years, and went live again on October 6th. And, you know, I've read people thinking, you know, that's not a mere coincidence, an indication perhaps of a larger group who knew that something was impending. You have any personal so, understanding? Or? Yeah, so so look, I, the you know, as a researcher, the most important thing we always say is correlation doesn't mean causation, right? Just before something turned, you know, it, it, we, there's no indication of it. There is malpractice here, but there's like ill intent. But what it does show, and that's an important thing, just because there's no conspiracy doesn't mean that there's no, no big issue here. And the issue is that they were ready. Right. They were ready. 
They were ready all around the country. On October 8th, you saw protests in urban areas all around the country. Uh, on October 12th, Colombia had a protest very few days after, like all the other countries. If you look at the SJP's website, the national SJP website, on October 8th, they had a toolkit, a three, four page toolkit. They didn't write that down in, in you know, 24 hours. That was, they were ready. They just updated a few things. That's how things work. Um, just because they weren't, may or may not have been uh, coordinated in the fight, they were ready for the fight. Right, right, well said, well said. Um, so you and I met on November 22nd by campus and, and by then there was a lot of pushback. And in fact, Columbia just a week later on Friday night, December 4th, held a Friday night Shabbat dinner that had almost a thousand just undergraduate and graduate students. It wasn't even alumni or parents of students. They weren't even invited. Um, and it happened to have coincided also with a board of trustees meeting that weekend. So in attendance that night at this Friday night Shabbat dinner were, because I spoke with, with them, was, was President Shafiq, Claire Shipman, David Greenwald, and many other trustees and professors. And by December 11th, Liz McGill was gone at University of Pennsylvania. Claudine Gay was next. And then shortly thereafter, Sally Cornbrook. And it looked like we maybe had some momentum uh, and wind at our backs. Um, and then we had winter break and a, and a very welcome respite. But we came back from winter break. What happened after winter break that, I mean, the, the wind in our sails seemed to have gone entirely another direction. Yeah, I mean, it, it was a chronicle of it that foretold. You know, uh, from the very first moment, um, Colombia had a very, very clear and childish strategy. And it was, keep our head down and this will go away. I actually met with the senior vice president in the end of October and I told him, this will not go away. This is not something that just disappears on itself. This is hate. Hate doesn't, people don't stop hating. They just, hate either lies dormant or grows. And then Colombia had an, a, a second strategy, which is okay, it's not gonna go away, but run the clock till uh, to, till winter break. You know, just like in basketball where we're leading, let's just run the clock. Students will go home and things will quiet down. And by the way, I motivate, like there was wishful thinking on my part as well, mm -hmm. despite knowing that this won't happen. It didn't happen. Students came back with a vengeance, right? Then Columbia said, let's run the clock of the spring semester, right? We saw that that didn't work. Then they said, let's just run the clock till graduation. So today and in the next few days, thinking like, oh, and then students are going away and this doesn't, you know, and that's a problem. And I'm here to remind Columbia, Three months from now, three and a half months from now, we are starting a new semester. The faculty that are supporting the Hamas and the students' organizations are not going away. 75% of these students, the ones that didn't graduate, are coming back. And new students that are already being radicalized in high school and are choosing Columbia because of you know, the social activism are going to join. These problems do not go away. So we can... We can explain it from the student's perspective, the, the anger. You can explain it from the faculty perspective, the impunity of, you know, you can say whatever you want when you have tenure, even if it's hateful, as long as it's targeted as Jews. But really, the big problem is the administration that is just thinking that these problems will go away and, and not learning. You know, it, it, you're in VC. Like, you would never invest in founders that do not change their strategy based on reality and but that's what's happening at columbia yeah no i hear you i hear you. so so let's turn to the students for a second because i know that's obviously the most important uh issue and, and we're going to go back and forth and try and tie a lot of these themes together but you know they're the most important constituents in the whole discussion obviously um you know early on we saw noah fay and and she spoke very eloquently at the rally in washington uh david pomerantz uh, who's a junior or a senior, has been on Fox News several times. He's actually the son of a very good friend and Columbia classmate of mine, Roy Pomerantz. There have been other students like Eden Yedegar of Students Supporting Israel at Columbia. Maya Platic, who some people know, was now elected as the president of the class of the School of General Studies. But 
Uh, uh, Lishi Baker, the co-head of Aria, he's also been very. So, so how are the students uh, doing? And and also to some extent, what is now the reaction of the not what I'll call the non-affiliated students, the non-involved students on campus? Because when I went up to campus and got my sort of alumni CUID in March, I, I happened to have walked out of Butler and bumped into literally hearing like three or four guys speaking Hebrew. And I started talking to them and I said, you know, what's going on? And they said, a lot of the other students are kind of fed up. Now this is pre-Hamilton, pre, this is pre-encampment by the way. Um, but talk about that for a second. The Jewish students, how are we doing? Uh, the non-affiliated students. You know, in every tragedy versus silver lining, and for me, one of the most amazing silver lining has been meeting the Jewish students. Like I teach in the grad level, so we don't have undergrads. And all of a sudden meeting all these incredible Jewish undergrads, they give me hope. They really give me hope for the future. Um, I'll tell you this. So a few weeks ago, uh, the week the, the weekend before the congressional hearing, I was at a Chabad uh, at dinner, at Shabbat uh, dinner. Um, just went to meet the students, you know. Talk at, the at, students. Columbia. at Columbia. At um, Columbia. As you can imagine, I'm not the kind of person that typically goes to Chabad, but ever since October 7th, me and Rabbi Yuda have been very close. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. and, I, met, and, and I met this, this, student, this student that has been very active, Jono. Uh, he said, hey, by the way, I'm going to another dinner at, uh, at the, um, the Hillel building at the Craft Center. Uh, we have a group called the Avne Group. Come and, you know, come, come join us. And I said, cool, sure. You know, I thought I'm, I was expecting like 15 Jewish students, you know. I go in, I go into the basement. There's about 300 Jewish students. They are just finished Shabbat dinner. They put on like skits. It was incredible. It was just like so heartwarming. And then I asked Jono, uh, I was sitting with Jono, Lishi, uh, some other students that have been very active. I said, where are all these people in the protest? Where are they? Like, and they said, some of them are tired, some of them are fed up, some of them are scared, and some of them are being told by their parents, focus on your schools. You know, And I don't blame any one of them. And this is important. I, I will never blame a Jewish student for not showing up because right. they have been put in a horrible position. So that's where we're at. You know, the a few students, Jewish and Israeli students that are out there, you know, fighting, uh, holding uh, Israeli and American flags, giving media interviews, but the vast majority are just worried or scared. They don't know what to do. Um, I just, I was on a in a conversation yesterday with Noah Fay, and she <laughs> said, like, I had to take a few months off of any activism because I was, I was behind on my studies and. That is what the other side wants. They want to distract us. Like, no, I came here to study. I need to study. Now, of course, I also need to be proud and Jewish, but it's hard doing both when it's a constant fight. Um, but but yeah, they're, they're there. And I, and I hope that we're, we're able to get the fire burning in their bellies um, to get them more engaged and feel safe doing so. Right. They also need an administration to help them feel safe. No doubt, no doubt. Now, how many students, just can you give us perspective, how many sort of students or people were in the encampment, so to speak? Uh, it's, I mean, it's, a, it's sort of, you know, the 80-20 rule. You know, you've got a, yeah. small, a lot of noise. Any, any idea? No one knows. No one knows, right? right? So um, no one knows because you have the, you have the leaders you have the core followers, what I call the cult, and then you have the, the, the group. So, so I happened to be walking on the second eve of Passover in the Upper West Side, in Morningside Heights, sorry. Um, and it was just when the university gave them their first deadline, mm -hmm. right? Uh, it was yes, midnight yes. I had to clear. By the way, as an aside, as someone who teaches negotiations, the moment they broke their first deadline, they lost all credibility. It went from new from midnight to 6 a.m. to 8 p.m. to 8 a.m. to 48 hours, 72 hours. You lose all credibility when you make a threat and you don't follow up on your friend. But what I saw, I was walking around. It was like 11.50 p.m. And I started seeing students from all over Morningside Heights running towards campus. 
to 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 bolster the encampment to make it harder for the police to 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 clear them so so while you have the 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 core which is like maybe 100 200 you had a few other hundreds that were helping them supporting them and then you had a couple hundred professors doing that uh but if you look at the 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 arrest uh sheets uh, the first time they arrested about 110 students for trespassing, New York City turnstile, you know, two hours later, we're back on campus. In the Hamilton Hall, they arrested about 120, 80 of which were Columbia affiliated and 40 of which were what they call outside agitators. But they're not outside agitators. They've been on campus since October, you know, leading and, and egging on the students. No, and some were clearly very professional protesters and looking at their bios and backgrounds. Um, uh, and, and we'll come back to the sort of takeover of, of, of Hamilton. I, I want to touch on something that I, I'm not sure we'd sort of get into, but on, on being Israeli. Um, uh, and let's tease this out for a second. So obviously you grew up in Israel, served in the IDF, I clearly presume. I and many of us on this call were up here in the U.S. I lived and studied in Israel briefly at been an ardent Zionist all my life, yet I'm going to posit uh, the theory that we here in the U.S. Uh, expect anti-Semitism. You know, there was a Monty Python skit decades ago. Nobody expects the Spanish Inquisition. I think we, I think we expect anti-Semitism. And while you uh, and other Israelis expect adversaries, um, but also expect Westerners to, in a sense, push back on insanity. Yeah. We live with insanity and think we maneuver around it. And sort of said differently, I'd say you are empowered. And I would say here in the U.S. Jewish community, we, we, we rely on the pa our power, but on the power of others and our power of persuasion. So is it a bit naive to say that I believe the Columbia administration didn't know what to do with you? Like they didn't know how to respond to you, to rightly expect and demand equal standing and the denunciation of Hamas. And, and in fact, we in the, di and I'll say the diaspora, we still walk around, you know, needing needing to some extent rely on others. Does, does that make sense to you? Does that resonate at all? No, I'm not saying we don't fight. We fight here. I, I, really, I really believe you're absolutely right. So when I saw, you know, October 7th was a, was a, punch in the face for all of us. For me, the, the reaction in the US was a second punch in the face because I've, I have I did not grow up with this. I didn't, you know, you probably, you and, and many people on this call, like grew up with some minor version of anti-Semitism. Maybe as a kid, your parents tell you, don't worry, it's too, you know, you develop the, the, the defense mechanism. So when something like this happens, it's big, it's influential, but you have the infrastructure. I did not grow up with the, you know, with the infrastructure to deal with anti-Semitism. So when it happens for the first time and it happens like this, I was like, wait, no, this is wrong, right? It, it, this is just unacceptable. And that was my reaction, but I think you're absolutely right. Columbia University, at least for a very long while, believed that they, had a Shai Davidai problem, not a Jewish problem, not an anti-Semitism problem. And they thought if we just either ignore this one guy or then later try to silence him through an investigation that's completely baseless, but if we just focus on this one guy, we can, we can solve the problem. So in their mental math, it was like, we have like 800 protesters, we have one guy, who, who's easier to deal with? Let's deal with the guy. First of all, they were wrong because dealing with me is very hard, you know, but 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 because they, they really thought that I represent myself. And I told them from early on, it, this is not the Shai Davidai story. This is not about myself. If I weren't the one to speak up, someone else would because this is a bigger issue. Oh, yeah. yeah. They, and, uh, and I will say uh, there are there are and I'll come back to this. Uh, I think we'll have time, but you know, I think there have been some other very talented vocal people, both in the front lines and behind the scenes, doing some great work through the Columbia Jewish Alumni Association uh, and uh, and some other groups. Professor uh, uh, Ron Kibitz, also at the business school, has been fantastic. He did the interview with uh, um, 
Mm, I always get his name wrong. But... Osab Hazan Yusuf. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Ron, I have to say, I did not, I knew of Ron. He works a few floors above me in the building. I've never met him before this. And I have just the utmost respect for him. He's fantastic. Yeah, I, I quite agree. Okay. So I want to go back now. Um, and this has to do not just with Columbia, but it does have to do with Columbia. But I, I, I want to talk about whether you've had a moment to think about how long this has taken to metastasize, quite frankly. And, mm -hmm. and where were we for so many years? And, I, and I'm going to say, I, I, I had never even watched Columbia Unbecoming. So I'm going to recommend to all of you, Google Columbia Unbecoming and watch it. It's 35 to 45 minutes. Um, and I have to say, I, I, I don't recognize the Columbia of 2004, let alone 2024. So when I was on campus, um, Edward Said was alive and teaching English literature. I took his class. I, I just moved and found my copy of his book, and I'm rereading it, actually, which I also, believe it or not, recommend everyone read. Um, but Arthur Hertzberg taught history of Zionism, which was one of the most popular classes on campus. Columbia Unbecoming is a film, for those of you who don't know, that describes the absolute vicious campus scene back in 2004 that was so prophetic and prescient. And so, you know, we were thinking for so long that we held the sort of hearts and minds of the masses on our side, but there's this thing called, you know, tenure. And um, the Middle Eastern Department, I guess, in that time frame, in the early 2000s and for the next 10, 20 years till today, hired an all-star list of Joseph Massad and George Saliba and Rashid Khalidi, whose book I also have, Hamid Dabashi, and I imagine others. Um, how, I don't know, you haven't been there that long, but how did they achieve this? How did camp, how, how did, did that get, happen? Huh? How did that happen? How this happen? Yeah. So uh, uh, I'll tell you this. It's and it's not you, unique to Colombia either. Yeah, so. it's not unique to Colombia, but Colombia is the uh, epitome of this. The way academics work, the, the biggest, most sacred value to academics is not the truth, unfortunately. It's not education, unfortunately. It's self-governance. It's all about you don't tell us how to manage ourselves, us. That is the biggest issue for all of my colleagues it drive me nuts. Self-governance is an incredibly important issue. There are other issues that are more important, like the truth in education. But mm -hmm. the, the idea of self-governance is we get to decide what we teach, how we teach, and who teaches, right? And another thing is we work as a democracy, democ the, you know, the majority rule. So you actually don't need 100% pro-Hamas professors in a department. What you need is 51% pro-Hamas professors in a department, and then they that slowly becomes 60%. That's and how slowly... big is a department? I mean, just educate. When you talk a department, I don't know how... So, yeah, I mean, de departments vary from 15 to 30 people. Okay, um, so it's, not, it's not that many people. So, you know, what happens is, uh, to take the, the example of the Middle East, uh, but just to start, Colombia as, as a whole, you know, there's been a slow and silent purge of dissenting views, of opposing views. It's not unique to Zionism, you know, it's not unique to that. It's been on every hot topic issue, there's been a slow and silent purge of, of uh, dissenting views. And it's not being done, people are not saying let's purge, but they're saying, who do we agree with? Who do we like? Well, you like the person that has the same conclusions as you. Someone like Joseph Massad, if you look at his at his uh, at his uh, curriculum vita, like you know how how did he end up where he is? Well, he got his PhD at Columbia. The very next year, he became a professor at Columbia. That is something that in most fields you do not do, right? In most fields, we are aware that we can because of the power structure and 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 this, the danger of indoctrination. You get a PhD in one place. I got a PhD in Cornell. You cannot work at Cornell. You go somewhere else. Then after a few years, you can get hired back based on your views. That was not the case with Joseph Massad. So Joseph Massad, 
got uh, his PhD at Columbia. The, ne the very next year became a professor at Columbia, right? So they already increased the number of professors that agree with them. And then he goes up for tenures about six years later. So, so sorry, before he goes up to tenure versus Columbia, I'm becoming a really eye-opening movie. He uh, there's a committee to 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 figure out what's wrong with Joseph Mossad, like this, you know, thing that came out with in in this movie. Well, who is in the committee? His friends, his friends and peers, right? So they go through the motions. This is very Soviet Union. They go through the motions. They say, well, there's a few things that might have been unacceptable, but ever anyway, it's fine. Okay, so he he survives this. He goes up for tenure. People don't know Joseph Mossad did not get tenure. He actually failed to get tenure. There was a big, you know, noise. By the way, Ron Kivitz was back then fighting Joseph Mossad because like this person should not get tenure. Mm. There was a big noise and stink about it from the Middle Eastern studies. So uh, then President Bollinger set up another committee. This is something unique that almost never happens. Another alternative independent tenure committee not including many members of the original tenure committee, staffing it with people that like Joseph Mossad, and that's when he got tenure. So you can see just, with, and you know, fast forward, October 8th, he writes that October 7th was awesome. You can see how there is a systematic, it's not a bad apple. It, it It's a systematic way of keeping, you know, a certain way of thought in this system. And of course, this happens with a lot of others uh, like them. You know, um, like we, you know, one of the big people that has been the big agitators is Muhammad Abdu, uh, the one that, you know, uh, President Shafiq lied under oath, said he's been terminated, right? He's grading papers. He's still on campus, right? But he's not even a full professor. Columbia. He's a visiting professor. Right. But so how is his CUID still... I, I mean, I know you don't have an answer, so it's a rhetorical. I don't have an answer, but here's the thing. Who invites visiting professors at the department level? Oh. There is no overseeing this. So if if Joseph Mossad tomorrow wants to invite uh, Sinwar to be a, you know, uh, a, a professor of practice, the U.S. government might stop him because it's a terrorist. Columbia University won't right, right, right. because it's free speech. Oh. Uh, what I'm going to do is it's 1248. I have so much more to go over with you, but I do want to hit some questions in case yeah, there are who, who have got to leave. And and maybe, I don't know, maybe we'll have to do a uh, a, a shy redux, a, a show number two, possibly. But OK, let's uh, let's dive in here. So first of all, I, I do want to point out and give a shout out to my sister who's saying that when she was at Columbia or Barnard, uh, she actually took a class with that Hertzberg and Khalidi both taught. Mm hmm. Now, I don't even know if that would happen to it. First of all, who teaches history of Zionism? Does any, is, is that taught, history of Zionism now? Not that I'm aware of, at least not right. by Zionists. Right, 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 not by Zionists. Okay, um, so uh, just quickly, how much responsibility uh, do you place on actual Columbia students versus outside agitators? And I saw an interesting chart on this, uh, I think versus CUNY, uh, but um, do, you, do you have a sense of uh, how much is sort of I put 100% um, responsibility on the, the organization leaders of Colombia, okay. right? The agitators won't be able to come in. They won't be able to, you know, rile people up if they weren't invited by the student organizers and by the faculty advisors. Right, right. So here's another question I wanted to ask in a slightly different way, but, you know, A, where, where are the other allied professors? Are they speaking to you privately? Are there others? I know there was just a letter to Spectator uh, written by uh, a number of uh, faculty pushing back on the protesters, the uh, uh, pro-Palestinian protesters. But, you know, it, it, is that group coming uh, out of the woods, so to speak? And are there administrators and trustees, even on a no-name basis, that are kind of Shy, I'll work with you, or not just you, but to Brian Cohn of Hillel or to Rabbi Dreisen or others. So, uh, in terms of uh, people, they've been in the back on, on backstage since the beginning. I am not. This is not a one man show. It might seem like a one man show because I'm the one front and center, but I couldn't do this without the support of, I'd say, a few dozen uh, Jewish and Israeli professors. Unfortunately, most 
professors, Jews or non-Jews, are not being vocal. Um, but a lot of people are doing things behind the scenes. In terms of trustees, you might find this um, surprising or shocking. None of them has ever contacted me or reached mm -hmm. out. President Schiff has never replied to any one of my emails. Mm -hmm. um, it, yeah, it's... So, it, so you have never had any interaction with like Claire Shipman or David Greenwald? No, I mean, they... Yeah, David, they, Scheiser, David Scheiser, now the interim at the law school? I saw David Scheiser once uh, at a Chabad dinner. Mm -hmm. um, he did his thing, I did mine, but mm -hmm. no... No one has ever. I've had some interaction with with the with with David as part of the anti-Semitism task force, which I I see as a complete sham and an administration tool. But you know we have some disagreements there. But um, but none of the trustees has ever even reached out to say, hey, you know, what's your solution or what's your ideas or how can we help or no no. I, I by the way, if I can interject one thing, I, I was visiting yeah. Harvard. Um, an MIT uh, on Monday, and I met someone, and he, and he said, "Look, Harvard is a real estate company with an education arm, and MIT is a VC um, enterprise with an education arm. And I think Columbia is also it's become a real estate company with some educational focus. And I think the trustees are really thinking about it this way. They are running a real estate company." And they're not interested in in dealing with every anything else. But that's my only explanation of why they wouldn't reach out, you know, to me or at least through indirect paths to say like, hey, you know, like you've been the most vocal proponent of the Jewish students. Let's talk. But nothing. Hmm. So uh, um, let's talk about you know the money trail. That's how Al Capone got. Uh, arrested. Um, let's follow the money. Uh, what is your sense of the money coming from abroad, funding Middle East Studies Department, whether it's Qatari, Saudi, and what, I mean, should the Israeli government be doing anything? Should, in, in funding chairs and, and uh, research in other areas? I've heard that uh, asked in a bunch of circles. I heard that asked directly to uh, um, uh, you know, some ministers in the current government. Uh... So, yeah, for in terms of the money coming in, the truth is we don't know. We don't know because there is no obligation of these institutions to be transparent. And that fits them very well because they don't want to be transparent. We, in fact, we know that, you know, in the past few years, some of these universities have hidden some of the money. So one of the fights that I'm fighting is just for transparency in education. I need. I think that every university that gets even one dollar from state, city, state, or federal funding need to be completely transparent of where we're getting all their money. Foreign governments, foreign individual donors, even donors here. We need to know who we're getting from, how much we're getting, and what's it earmarked for, so we can have think tanks actually examine this and study the influence. In terms of what Israel should do, look, we will never outnumber or outcash our haters. So yes, we should be engaging more in education, money, and again, being transparent about it. Yeah. But really, I think that Israel is not the, the, shouldn't be in the forefront. I think Americans should be in the forefront because this is, this is a corruption of the American education system. And if if we really truly believe that education is our number one resource, then we need to take it seriously and not let foreign interference um, do that. Yeah, I, the way I tell people to remember this, if China or, or Russia or Qatar started buying real estate in your street, you would want to know. You would want to know if they're starting to buy in bulk. Well, right now, I want to know if they're buying real estate in students' minds. They're buying microchips, which is intellectual capital right there. So there's a, and there's a pushback on that from both sides of the aisle, Republican and Democrat. So it's exact, it is exactly that, that question. I agree with you. Um, so uh, let, let's, uh, let's go back to Washington for a second, because 
we sort of glossed over Columbia's <laughs> Columbia's turn in Washington, D.C. Uh, I, I kind of felt we were all hopeful uh, for what might happen on a, a April 17th um, mm -hmm. and that maybe some kind of change would be afoot with President Shafiq's uh, uh, testimony, especially with what happened with the other presidents. Um, and uh, again, I want to give a shout out to uh, people at the Columbia Jewish Alumni Association for doing amazing work and 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 documenting and categorizing meticulously in a database all the acts of anti-Semitism on campus that were sent down to the Education Committee in Washington. For those of you who don't know, you know those questions, by the way, by Elise Stefanik and and uh, Representative Fox, and they don't just appear. There was a lot of work that went on behind the scenes for that, and. Um, uh, and I believe they cc'd every piece of material that went down to the Columbia administration. Um, what was your takeaway from from April seventeenth? You know, it, to me, President Shafiq looked like an awful combination of waffling, being evasive, outright lying, and simply not knowing her facts. I I have one word for it. You know, it's it, the one of the, the the traits that I detest the most in people is arrogance. And mm. she, we we did not see President Shafiq. We saw Baroness Shafiq. Mm. She just came arrogant. She thought that, oh, they'll ask me, is calling for a genocide okay? I'll say no. And then I'll... she was, she just, it shows how much she was only prepared to answer questions rather to deal with the issues. And her lack of preparation shows her lack of care. Did you feel that Claire Shipman and David Greenwald and, and Dean David Scheiser acquitted themselves well on behalf of Columbia and address anti-Semitism head on? You don't have to answer that if you don't want. No, but I, I, I do want to answer. I, I do want to answer that. Um, I, I want to preface it by saying, many the 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 road to hell is paved with good intentions, and I do not think that they have any any bad intentions, but especially David Greenwald and um, and David Schitzer, uh, were they they played the role of a fig leaf for the administration. Uh, they don't realize what they did. I hope one day they will realize they were part, they are still part of the problem by and by going up there and just being like, look, we are Jewish and everything is fine when everything is not fine. And I, and, and I, I use this. I didn't this think they, okay, I want to make sure I yeah, understand it, what you heard. Did I didn't hear them say everything was fine. I do think, by the way, Claire Shipman was the one who was the most clear about right. saying things were fine. Well, they they were saying they weren't saying everything is fine, but they were saying everything is under control, ah. right? That was the thing. Like we, like they were saying everything is under control. Two weeks later, they break in, they take you know a janitor hostage. Yeah, everything's under control. But but I do want to say one thing, and this is why I am not a politician. I am not part of an organization. I just speak for myself, and that's why I allow myself to do this. The Friday before the testimony. Like I said, I saw David Schitzer at a Chabad dinner and he spoke eloquently. A student then came up to me and said, I wanted to talk about the definition of anti-Semitism and he wanted to talk about the definition of definition, <laughs> right? But what really bugged me was he was not wearing the yellow ribbon for the hostages. Mm. He was wearing it when he went to Congress. And to me, that was when you... When you uh, when you're at Chabad addressing the Jewish students, you're with the Jewish students. That's where you need to show your 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 support, your 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 de 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 dedication, your devotion. Not when you're going to be a fig leaf in Congress and then like say you know we got it under control. And that that bugged me just as a complete. And I'm sure again, I don't think he did it out of bad intentions, but I see it. I see the BS. All right, so two more quick things before we hit the rest of the country, which is really important. Um, I went on the record to some friends saying I thought Shafiq would be out by May 1st. So but in the venture world, we like to say we're never wrong. Sometimes we're just too early. Uh, but I'm not sure that holds true in this case. Like, it, for the moment, it seems to me she's going to hold on. Yeah, I mean, look, Shafiq is not the problem. She is the symptom, yeah. right? The, remember that the, the, the trustees wrote a letter in support of her a few days before Hamilton Hall got overtaken. She is the symptom of a much bigger problem that's happening in the university. Look, Harvard thought we'll just get rid of Claudine Gay, which they should have, right? 
and everything will go away. Like, and we'll put a Jewish person and then definitely have been, like that. No, like you need to be willing to turn on, to, to overturn every stone, not just throw away the most convenient one. Well, it starts with the president, but I do agree with you. I think that the longer game is, is, is faculty administration and change in DEI. Now I was encouraged. It's one tiny, tiny step that MIT has said they're no longer requiring new employees to, I guess, sign a DEI, um, you know, uh, a paper or something to be employed. I, now, there's a lot of tokenism. There's a lot of, you know, if we do this, we don't have to do that. Um, Look, but I, I do have to say something about DEI, you know, first of all, I, I have zero tolerance for symbolism. Yeah, like sign, like you can sign whatever you want. I want actions, but I'll say this about DEI. It's very there's a lot of contention about DEI offices, DEI officers. I care about diversity, equity, and inclusion. The ideas behind DEI are good ideas. The practice is problematic. The issues, but because what we're seeing now on campuses throughout the country is so much focus on diversity and equity and no focus on inclusion. And what we're seeing now is that Jews and Israelis are excluded from physical spaces, right? They're excluded from physical spaces on campus. That's the, that's the basic inclusion. So while I don't wanna throw away the water, the, the baby with the, with the bath water, I don't, yeah. I don't have the solutions for the DEI behemoth that has taken over the United States, but I am still committed to the ideas of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And, and, and I think we should separate those two things. No, I we, think that's great. Way... So where is SEPA in all this? SEPA had one event. It had Claire Shipman moderating a discussion between Dean Karen Yarfe Milo, Israeli, and uh, Dean Amani Jamal, uh, who is, from what I understand from David Mikowski, is quite highly regarded at, at Princeton, uh, Palestinian, head of the uh, former Woodrow Wilson School. And that's it. Have there? There's been nothing else from SEPA, as far as I know, in trying to bring together thought and conversation. Unlike Dartmouth and some other places, but uh, has well, there been anything? And where's SEPA? You got to remember that 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 exact event that you mentioned that was supposed to create dialogue and bring people from different views was uh, was boycotted, but not by Jews. It was boycotted by the pro Hamas. They not just boycotted it; they actually picketed it. They 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 tried to disrupt it. Um, I don't. The truth is, I don't know. I really don't know. I. <laughs> well, let's not go on what you don't know. Let's talk about but, others. But I do want to say something so people understand the what who professors are. Yeah. Professors, and I and I'm going to get flagged from my colleagues maybe, but professors are failed entrepreneurs, or or I would say risk averse entrepreneurs. What does that mean? They are people that want to uh, do their own thing, determine their own fate, but not take any risk and get a salary and tenure. That's So most of them are not gonna go up and just like, you know, let's organize something, let's fight back. Most of them are gonna be like in their own little bubble trying to just keep going. And this is why SIPA, School of Social Work, many other schools where this has been like the hotbed You've seen very little reaction from the professors, the deanships. So let's talk about universities. I have a junior in high school. I'm sure many people on this call uh, are either in school or have kids in school or are about to go to school. There are many schools in this country who have seemingly kind of what I'll say done the right thing. They've allowed free speech, but they've also created a protected uh, environment as well where people can study and learn and feel like they can go about doing what they're supposed to do. We don't have to go naming all the names, but sort of University of Florida, I mean, many others, and even others that have had controversy have done a, an infinitely better job than uh, Columbia. So uh, what do you tell, uh, what would you tell other parents? And we've got some questions here about, you know, and, and there have been some thought about, you know, do you leave the Ivies? Are the, you know, are they rotten to the core? And you know, abandon ship, or uh, if you leave, you know, you create a vacuum, and you know, the in the the inmates run the asylum. Uh, it's a tough question for everyone. I say, I mean, again, this is my views and my personality. I say, stay and fight. Right. I say, 
it you, there's no place you can send your all look i'll start with this every parent wants to protect their kids that's our most important thing like before anything else i want to make sure that my son and my daughter are safe and healthy everything else is will follow there's no place where you can completely keep your kids safe there are better there are worse places and somewhat better places so it's not where you send them it's how you send them if you want to protect your kids don't try to you know, shield them from the world, prepare them for the world, which means, you know, get them in the habit of wearing their Jewishness out in the open. I've started wearing a Star of David. It could be just put them out there in safe areas at first so they get ready. Give them books to read, engage them in conversation, you know, give them the kind of pushback that they will get on campus. Hey, Danny, what's your son's name, if you, if I may? Yeah, I, well, I've got four, but the one I'm talking about is Isaac, my youngest. <laughs> I was like, hey, Isaac, you know, you're going to be in, a, in college. doesn't matter where you go. Some, you know, a-hole is going to say, oh, you know, Israel is, you know, ethnically cleansing Palestinians. What are you going to say about that? And he was like, oh, you know, and you're like, no, Isaac, convince me. If you can't convince me and I'm on your side, why can't, you know, you, you have to prepare your kids to that. I tell people that have the resources send your kids to a, to a gap year in Israel. If it's a religious seminary one or yeshiva, if it's in the Negev, it's in Kibbutzim, you know, in the uh, first aid units, whatever it is based on their interest, you know, mm -hmm. don't look at it as wasting a year. Look at it as investing a year. If you send your kid to even one or even six months in Israel by themselves, not with mommy and daddy, they're going to come back ready to just cut through the BS, they're going to see through it. You know, I see it. I see the students that have spent time in Israeli students or students that have spent time in Israel. They walk more proudly on campus. They're more safe. They're more, they're the ones, most of the ones that have been active have been those that have direct physical relationship with, in Israel with family, with friends on their own. So they are not phased by all these arguments that just don't hold water. Right, right, right. Um, yeah, I hear you. So, uh, you know, one of the things that occurs to me is, you know, I love the, uh, you know, the Marxist, uh, uh, jihadists, uh, on campus, you know, screaming, you know, globalize the intifada. I think if you ask the average Palestinian, they would, they would say, wait, what, what do you mean? What does it mean to globalize the intifada? Isn't the intifada here? Um, you know, there's, um, there's a constituency that is being driven by uh, uh, a lot of globalist thinking that is just irrelevant, uh, it seems. I, I want to say something about the globalized intifada because because we become so desensitized to it. I want, and I think it's important that people remember, right? In Israel, the intifada is a violent is is the violent action against uh, soldiers and civilians of Israel. Under the assumption that Israel is doing, you know, occupying uh, um, territories, we need to fight the oppressor, right? Regardless of where you stand on that, that's the what's happening. When you say globalized the Intifada, you're basically saying New York City or Westchester, Danny Schultz in Westchester, he's part, he's an oppressor. That's what we need to bring the Intifada to him. You know, the mayor of New York City, the mayor of Los Angeles, they are targets because. We need to bring the Intifada there. They they basically see the entire world that they don't agree with as the oppressor. That is one of the most dangerous ideas that we have had to deal with in the last 20, 30 years. Right. No, no doubt. So um so here you are, a hundred just shy of a hundred thousand uh followers. And you've got a pulpit. Um I uh, I imagine where you go, people recognize you and engage with, with you. Unfortunately, um, yeah. I mean, I love these people, but I'm, I'm, I am a part, private person, so it feels weird. But I love talking with people and getting to know them. So, 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 ha have you had conversations with people one on one or small groups? Um, you know, not videoed or whatever, where people say, "I'd never looked at it that way." Thank you. Like, are you, do you, and do you have a, um, a, a few arrows in your quiver that you feel are persuasive? Um, like, I'm fond of saying to people online that the Nakba 
the catastrophe is that we could be celebrating 76 years of a Palestinian state by now. That's enough. Yeah. Um, people are like, oh, I, I didn't think of that. <laughs> most people, when you, when you, especially if they're devoted to a side, whatever the side is, it's very unlikely that they will tell you, oh, wow, thank you. I haven't thought about it this way. Well, so, I was simple. I was being simplistic, yeah, but yeah. But, uh, but I'm not, so, so that's not my goal. <laughs> Okay. I'm playing. I'm playing the long game. I'm, you know, I am seeding the ideas of peace and coexistence in people's minds, with the hope that one day they will blossom. Um, okay, so you turned down. I know you turned down Mark Lamont Hill. Oh, and and, and 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 for lo lots of great reasons. But yeah. I will say, um, a as awful as he is. Uh, he has following, and you yeah. have a persuasive voice. And I'm not saying you did the wrong thing. Yeah, no, no, no. I, I, I think, I think that's right. So, so we need to remember who Mark Lamont Hill is. You know, he has, he is friends with terrorists. He's, he's excused PFLP terrorists. He has written about Satanist yeah. Jews. Join the meeting. Uh, you know, if. If social media existed back then, Joseph Goebbels would have had an amazing following. I would not go on his show, on his podcast, because I will not go in conversation with someone who believes I do not have a right to exist. You cannot convince someone I have a right to exist. I will speak with Holocaust deniers, October 7th deniers. I will speak with any hater in the world, but I will not try to convince someone that I am human. I would say, and I agree with you, and I think that's a great distinction. So far be it from me, because I'm not the one being invited to Mark Lamont Hill's podcast. Um, but I would also, at least for the moment, state that you wouldn't be talking to Mark Lamont Hill. You'd be talking to uh, his constituents, um, many of whom will see that you are a human. And I'm not trying to change your mind. Yeah, it's, my, my, my concern is this, and this is- and he's the wrong one. <laughs> I think I think this is something that I learned I had to learn painfully in the past seven months. Whoever controls the the media controls the message. Yep. And when you go on someone else's radio station yep. and or podcast or something, they can edit it in a way that you know in in any way they want. They control who the audience is. Mm -hmm. I might be open to having a conversation with a hateful person like himself. Um, on neutral, on neutral, unbiased terms, you know, rather than you know go and and by the way, I think there is an important thing about normalizing. We normalizing hate because if Shia Dabi die, people that you know, there's nothing unique about me, but people, you know, respect the message. If I go and and talk with someone who's a hateful person, it's saying okay, maybe maybe mm. there's. I want people to be clear, like no, like people that don't see me as fully human, I will not go and debate them. There's nothing to point and, and point taken. I want to I want to move on. I want to try and end on a super positive note here, which is um, uh, it's going to sound not positive at first, but it's going to get positive. Um, like, are we bad at this? Are, are we net set up for this type of combat? Are we merely outnumbered uh, or are we learning kind of a new way to do this? Um, and so, you know, not I'm not going to ask, can we turn this around? But but I want to know from your point of view, you know, how do we do this? We've got institutions like the ADLs and the AJCs, but now we've got social media of lots of very, very influential people uh, who are creating some great content as well. How do we do this? Whatever this is. Let's Look, talk Danny, about I think we're amazing at this. We're not okay. just good at this, we're amazing at this. If you if you consider the fact that, you know, the other side has been preparing for decades, what we have done in seven months is cat is, is incredible. Like we're we're still catching on. Yeah. But but this is, you know, I think we're really incredible. So uh the truth is like, how do we deal with this? It depends on what the, this is, what the goals are. There are many different ways. Um one of the stories I think of this fight is how regular people, myself, just jumped into the rink and, and started, you know, and took it upon themselves. I don't make any money out of this. If anything, I spend my own money on this. Um, 
Eitan Chitiak, who's uh, a friend that I met in the past seven months, has been doing this for years, you know, with his own money, trying to raise funds now to keep going. So, you know, that's one way we can do this. Organize, you know, some organization that will just help regular people do this. Um, we need to get involved. That is the one thing. And when I say we, I mean all of us. Like right now, there's 131 people on this call. Before that, there's almost 200. We, all of us need to get involved, meaning that we don't have the luxury not to be in PTAs, no matter how big or small the school is. We don't have the luxury to not be involved in our children's decisions of where to go to high school, where what to major in college, you know, and involve them in that. We don't make the decision for them. We uh, professors do not have the luxury of saying it's not in my department, then I don't, it's not my concern. Um, we don't have the luxury to say, well, city council, nothing never happens, so I won't be involved because things happen, but only the other side is going and in, and in, in lying, but you know, getting things done. Um, people have very different skills. Whatever your skills are, you, you just need to start using those skills. I really do think we will. I think we will see a shift. And when we'll see the shift, it'll be immediate. Our way of seeing that shift is making sure that non-Jewish Americans join us. Because this is not a fight for Israel. This is not a fight for, for the Jews. This is a fight for democracy, for common sense, for the Enlightenment versus the Middle, Middle Ages. And that's why I always tell people, like, you, something I said connected with you, something I said inspired you, send that to someone else who's not Jewish, right? Because that's, that's the only way. Uh... We will never outnumber them. We will never outcash them. But if we make the world realize, like, look, it starts with the Jews. It never ends with the Jews. Then, you know, they're coming for you. We are just the A-B testing. They are coming for you. They're mm -hmm. not just burning the Israeli flag. They're burning the American flag. They have a freedom to do so. It's their freedom of speech, but it shows their intentions. And we need to get regular, middle of the road, non-Jewish Americans. And it doesn't matter if you're left or if you're right. This is not a political issue. This is moderates versus extremes. I would much rather have, you know, moderate Republicans and moderate Democrats speaking with each other, working with each other, even if they disagree, but working together to fight off the extremes on both ends. And that's what we need to do. Here, 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 here. Uh, look, I, I've got I've got pages more of questions. I think we're gonna uh, stay for a few more minutes because I think yeah, I mean, well, it's important. All right, so let's let's go for another ten minutes. We'll we'll we'll, we'll go for another ten minutes here, and and people, please continue to uh, post your questions. Um, uh, Cheryl Sandberg's got the screams of silence, um, and uh, it it remains shocking that. Uh, many women's organizations couldn't come out and and uh, condemn what happened on October seventh. Uh, is is uh, there a way in your view? Have you been in touch with her? Is there a way in your view to get that shown on campuses? I'm sure she's working to do that. Uh, so, actually. yeah, that's a great. Um, we not that specific video, but we have another Jewish professor here, an incredible uh, woman, Amy Amy Berman. Uh, at the School of Social Work. She actually organized to show the a video, the movie of the Nova Festival. Ah. Um, and that's very important. Um, unfortunately, most of the people in attendance were people that already are, that already get it, but there are a few people that I hope were converts. Um, it's, yeah, I, it, the, the problem is not the materials. The problem is how do we get the materials to, the people that need to see them. And that is one of the biggest questions. I, I went to the Nova Festival exhibit in New York City. I don't know if people have been, it's it's limited time. I really urge everyone, there are survivors walking around telling their stories. It's just so incredibly well done. But I thought like, how do we get non-Jewish people to come on mass? And right now I don't know. I really don't know, but I think it's extremely important that everyone sees these, these things. And then make up their minds. I'm a professor. You know, if you still want to see these films and then shout from the river to the sea, I'll I, I won't agree with you, but at least I'll respect you. you know. 
because you've exposed because they would have exposed themselves because you look into every I, I mean I look at horrific images coming out of Gaza and I force myself even when it's painful because I want to make sure that I am not operating under some you know one-sided view and I'm really aware of the other side's pain and feel that pain and yet don't agree with her conclusions and I think that's where our humanity comes in and um, do you feel that with the protesters, uh, there's, um, it seems to me that the voyeurs may begin to sort of fall off uh, that, and I, and I saw the video from your um, being up at, I think it was Harvard yesterday. And, you know, it, it seems like their core is beginning to simply have the crazies, I'll call them. Um, and um, they're loud, they're annoying, um, but I, I think I do agree with you. We've got to stay the course and 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 you know make our speech. Um, but I want to bring in Israel here for a minute. Uh, does does the situation turn on what happens in Gaza in Rafa? Uh, uh, does it turn on who the government is? I heard Lapid's interview. Uh, I listened to his interview in the New York Times instead of reading it. Very important, actually, when you can do that, because you can hear intonation. Um, and we haven't talked about Israel at all, but does some of this turn on uh, how successful Israel is in, in Gaza and at, or, or no? So I, I want to be clear because a lot of, you know, one of the, the, the most anti-Semitic tropes that have just been reappearing everywhere throughout history is if only Jews didn't act in a certain way, there wouldn't be anti-Semitism. If only Israel didn't act in a certain way, there wouldn't be anti-Semitism. That's patently false. We will always have the hatred. Israel's actions and whatever happens with false problem is just the volume none. But you know, I don't want to be too, you know, prescient about it, but we're going to see more encampments. And we're going to see more encampments when Israel finally retaliates and, and deals with the danger in Lebanon. And when we see that, the first thing that you will see is probably people saying, oh, look at Israel, the oppressor, you know, going into Lebanon, uh, you know, without any reason. Well, for the past seven months, Israel has been under you know, constant attack from Lebanon, from the Hezbollah. Yesterday, a civilian, just a guy, a guy like myself, 40-something-year-old, uh, drove up north to, to celebrate Yom Atzmaut with his friend, got hit with an anti-tank missile. He was in his car, not in a tank. He was just in a, got hit, died from his wounds in, his, in, Le in, in northern Israel, from Lebanon. No one's talking about that. The media is completely uh, uh, avoiding it. And because they are, because no one in the politicians and the media is talking about it, when the encampments come, the student organizations are again going to feel emboldened into their lies and their false narratives. So it's not about what Israel does, but it's just their, it's just the, the volume knob. And I want to say something about the quote unquote crazies. I've been following what they've been doing since October 12th. The crazies were there from the very first moment. The crazies were there. In fact, they were there and, and journalists would ask, would, would kind of like minimize that and say, oh, are, are they just like a few crazy, blah, 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 a few kids. And, and it's like by making a joke out of it, by by infantilizing them, they weren't taking them seriously. Mm. And this is what happens. When do crazy people, and when, when I say crazy, by the way, I want to make sure this, this is not about mental health issues, which are extremely important. I mean, crazy in the sense of crazy narrative, crazy ideas, crazy crazy paths of action. When do they become loud? When they re when when they get egged on by society. Mm -hmm. Right? When you know they were they were crazy from the beginning, but when when politicians jumped on the bandwagon and started supporting them, when the media called their their violent protests peaceful protests, they're like, "Oh, I can now say everything I want even louder." You know, the guy that was one of the leaders, not the guy, I should say, the, the person that was one of the leaders of the encampment. Uh, I forget his name, their name. Kimani Kim, Kim, Kim James. 
Yes, come on in, James. Um, they said that Zionists should not be alive in January, not in April during the encampment. Like we've been experiencing this, but they have been slowly, you know, getting more and more press and attention. And by the way, that's working in our favor because the world now sees what they believe. Yeah, in. I was gonna. I I I post. I posted one day. God bless Kamani James. Protect that guy. I, <laughs> Protect him and let him talk as much as possible. My my strategy from very early on and from around November was give them as much rope so they can hang themselves with it. But we but because we you and I we know what they mean. They know what they mean, but they use coded language to stay under social justice or decolonization. All we need to do is let them expose themselves. And by and the way, your your post yesterday about when you substituted the I think it was yesterday or the day before when you substituted the language in the quote from the German somebody with yeah. the word social justice. Uh, everyone should go look it up. Was fantastic. It really yeah, should. Because one of the so one of the things is is exactly like Germany, you know, 1920s, 1930s, one of the biggest theoretical frameworks in academia was race, race science, race, race theory, theory. hygiene. And it was not contested in Germany at all, in the US maybe, but it was not contested in the same way that social justice, you know, worlds apart has different ideas. But social justice is, you're not allowed to contest it. And it's such a broad umbrella that then within social justice, it's not just reproductive rights, it's not just women's rights, LGBTQ, it's also let's kill the Jews as a social justice. And that is a problem. True, 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 true. Uh, I want you to um, mention your um, username for people to follow you. Oh, yes. Um, it's it's funny. I'm so not used to, to promoting myself. I'm just promoting the message. But uh, I'm on Instagram and on Twitter. Uh, the username is Shai Davidai, uh, just like I spell it, S-A-J-I-D-A-V-I-D-A-I. -I -I. Twitter is mostly just fighting anti-Semitism. And it's a hateful place. It's the best. If you if you are a true speech absolutist, go spend a half an hour on Twitter and let me know if you want that in the streets of New York. Yeah. Um, but uh, and then on Instagram, I try to cultivate a bit more of a hopeful human Jewish experience. Although there's a little bit also stuff like that there as well. Um, and then in closing, I'm just going to point out. For everybody, first of all, I heard you on Dan Senor's podcast, Call Me Back. I've been listening to Dan for a while. First of all, you were excellent. Second of all, for those of you who don't know, you should subscribe to Dan's podcast. He's excellent and has excellent people on. I'd recommend Noah Tishby's book, Israel, A Simple Guide to the Most Misunderstood Country in the World. I'd also recommend Bernard Lewis's book, What Went Wrong, Islam in the West. There's so much to read if you have time, but podcasts can certainly... <laughs> Do a good job of substituting for reading. Um, yeah, I would, I, I would recommend a few books as well if I can. Uh, yeah, I just please, reading, please. Uh, Rabbi Diana first goes. What uh, we need to talk about anti-Semitism. Uh, it's it's concise to the point. Uh, Barry Weiss's book, uh, How to Fight Anti-Semitism, and uh, David Badil's book, uh, Jews Don't Count, uh, are three. I think important books in the same way that a lot of us in May 2020 educated ourselves about racial issues. Um, I think everyone should read these books, Jews or non-Jews. Yeah. Well, look, we've got, I mean, so much work to do uh, and we're not going to complete it all today, but this was fantastic. Uh, I truly, truly appreciate it on behalf of everybody who was on here and I hope we can do this again. And, uh, and you and I should have another cup of coffee at Blue Bottle. I love um, that. Thank you so much. And, and thank you everyone for, for being here, you know, staying an hour and a half with me, listening to me is, is not, you know, to be taken for granted at all. And a late Chag Sameach, a late Yom Ha'atzmaut Chag Sameach to everybody. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye.